hello to everybody and welcome to my new video about atheist famous speeches and for this video we are going to analyze two letters of Charles Darwin. Now the image of Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein and a few American presidents have been longer used by atheists to prove that their atheism is accurate and correct. Now you're probably going to ask yourself, how come, how is this possible? Very simple, they're going to say, Darwin was an atheist, Einstein was an atheist, therefore to have an atheist position, it's accurate and correct. My first objection here is that we are talking about an argument from authority. That would mean if someone in a religious debate would try to bring that Darwin was an atheist or that Einstein was an atheist, that someone would actually try to suggest that the truth of the falsity of a religious claim is somehow related to the personal qualities of these people. My second objection here is that in many cases those persons who are mentioned as atheists are not even atheists, as is the case for Charles Darwin who was in fact an agnostic taste, how anyone can see from his own letters. It seems to me absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. You are right about Kingsley. Asa Gray, the eminent botanist, is another case in point, what my own views may be is a question of no consequence to anyone except myself. But as you ask, I may state, that my judgment often fluctuates. Moreover whether a man deserves to be called a theist depends on the definition of the term which is much too large a subject for a note. In my most extreme fluctuations I have never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of a god. I think that generally and more and more so as I grow older but not always, that an agnostic would be the most correct description of my state of mind. Dear sir your faithful ECH. Darwin. <laughs> Dear sir. I hope that you will not think it intrusive on my part, to thank you heartily for the pleasure which I have derived from reading your admirably written Creed of Science, though I have not yet quite finished it, as now that I'm old I read very slowly. It is a very long time, since any other book has interested me so much. The work must have cost you several years and much hard labor with for leisure for work. You would not probably expect anyone fully, to agree with you on so many abstruse subjects. And there are some points in your book, which I cannot digest. The chief one is, that the existence of so-called natural laws implies purpose. I cannot see this. Not to mention, that many expect, that the several great laws will someday be found to follow inevitably from some one single law, yet taking the laws as we now know them, and look at the moon, what the law of gravitation, and no doubt of the conservation of energy of the atomic theory, and C and C hold good, and I cannot see that there is unnecessarily any purpose. Would there be purpose, if the lowest organisms alone destitute of consciousness existed in the moon, but I have had no practice in abstract reasoning, and I may be all astray. Nevertheless you have expressed my inward conviction, though far more vividly, and clearly than I could have done, that the universe is not the result of chance. But then with me the horrid doubt always arises, whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value, or at all trustworthy. Would any one trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? Secondly I think, that I could make somewhat of a case against the enormous importance, which you attribute to our greatest men I have been accustomed to think, second, third, and fourth rate men of very high importance, at least in the case of science. Lastly I could show fight on natural selection having done, and doing more for the progress of civilization than you seem inclined to admit. Remember what risks the nations of Europe ran, not so many centuries ago of being overwhelmed by the Turks, and how ridiculous such an idea now is. The more civilized so-called Caucasian races have beaten the Turkish hollow in the struggle for existence. Look into the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of the lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. But I will write no more, and not even mention the many points in your work, which have much interested me. 
I have indeed cause to apologize for troubling you with my impressions, and my soul excuses the excitement in my mind, which your book has aroused. I beg leave to remain dear sir yours faithfully, and oblige Charles Darwin. Now at the end of this video I would like to send a big thank you to the Darwin Correspondence Project who has put at our disposal online so many of the Darwin letters. Thank you.